Okay, now let's practice this. Imagine the experiment is to roll a die. A will be the number rolled is even. B will be the number rolled is at least four. So we have our sample space, one, two, three, four, five, six. Event A would be two, four, six, and event B would be four, five, and six. What is the complement of A? We denote A complement as A bar, and it would be everything in the sample space, not in A. So that would be 1, 3, 5. What is the intersection of the complement of A with B? Well, the intersection, right down here, the intersection of the complement of A with B is denoted like that. And that would be equal to Remember, intersection means and, so it's got to be in A complement and B. So we've got 1, that doesn't qualify because that's not in B, 3, not in B, and 5. So the answer is 5, because what is in both A complement and B? 5. Keep going. What is the union of A with B? Denote that as a union B. For that, we want A or B. A is 2, 4, 6. B is 4, 5, and 6. So 2, 4, 5, and 6. Everything in A and everything in B. What is the union of A with the complement of B? The union of A with the complement of B, well, we need to know what the complement of B is. And the complement of B would be everything in the sample space that is not part of B. So it would be 1, 2, 3. As a result, A union B complement is A or B complement, so it's everything in A, 1, and everything in B, 2, 3, 5. And then finally, are A and B mutually exclusive, collectively exhausted? Well, A has 2, 4, 6, and B has 4, 5, and 6. Note that 4 and 6 are part of A and B. So no, they cannot be mutually exclusive because there is an intersection. Are they collectively exhausted? Well, for that, A and B would have to make up the entire sample space. And you'll notice that 2, 4, 5, and 6 are in there, but 1 is not. Therefore, you would still have something in your sample space even after accounting for event A and B. So no, they are not collectively exhausted. No mutual exclusivity, no collectively exhausted outcomes. All right, let's move on to assessing probability. There's actually three approaches that we can use. The first, called the classical assessment, is where we determine the probability by taking the number of times uh, an event occurs, say event A, divided by the total number of possible outcomes. This is what we've been doing uh, to keep it simple. And this works really well when you can define the sample space using theory. We know that if a deck of card has 52 uh, outcomes, then the probability of getting an ace is 4 out of 52. The probability of getting a black is 26 out of 52, etc. In contrast, the relative frequency assessment calculates probability with the same numerator, the number of time the event occurs, but it's divided by the number of trials, which is using past data rather than theory. For example, if we wanted to determine the probability of being the victim of uh, identity theft, we might look at the number of times people were victims of identity theft 
uh, last year divided by the total number of people. If we wanted to estimate the probability of getting an A in this class, we might look at the number of A's that occurred last year and divide it by the number of students that took this class last year. The key is we're using past data to assemble the denominator, not theory, which makes the denominator uh, variable from one study to the next. The third type of assessment is subjective. This is dealing with unique circumstances that often change and require a crude estimate of probability based on a personal conviction that an event will occur. This is the least scientific of the three, but may be the most practical. Um, we're forced every day to assess the probability of things happening just to protect ourselves from danger. For example, if you text while driving on the freeway, you know the probability of getting in, a, in an accident goes up. You don't need a classical or relative frequency assessment to make that judgment and a better decision. If you go out and play golf in a thunderstorm, you know that the odds of being electrocuted uh, by lightning go up compared to playing golf during a nice sunny day. So subjective probability is useful for everyday decision making. Now let's move on and talk about the fundamental principle of counting. We're starting a section now that is going to help us establish the denominators in our um, probability analysis. That is the number of possible outcomes or the number of trials. And to do that, we need to know how to count the total outcomes that might occur. The fundamental principle of counting says that if a choice consists of two steps, the first step can be done in A1 different ways, while the second step can be done in A2 different ways, then the choice can be made in A1 times A2 different ways. Example, if you're going to have a first child, there are two ways that that can occur. If you have a second child, there are also two ways that that can occur. So, 2 times 2 is 4. There are four possible outcomes of having two children. Boy, then a boy. Boy, then a girl. Girl, then a boy. Girl, then a girl. The diagram here is called a tree diagram. It gives us a visual aid of the choices and the total outcomes. The concept applies to more than just two choices. For example, here we flip a coin three times. If we want to know how many outcomes, we use the same process. On the first flip, there's two possible outcomes. On the second flip, there's two possible outcomes. And on the third flip, there's two possible outcomes. So 2 times 2 times 2 is 8. So there are 8 total outcomes that can occur by flipping a coin three times. Let's practice. This says how many three-letter sequences can be formed by the word parsimony. Let's create slots that represent uh, three-letter sequences. Okay? Another way of putting this is, you know, how many uh, words, uh, can three-letter words, can we create from this bundle of letters here, right? P-A-R-S-I-M-O-N-Y. And uh, it's going to depend because uh, are we allowed to use each of these letters uh, more than once. In other words, could we have, for example, PPP or uh, PAA, that kind of thing? Or can we only use each letter one time? Well, we'll start with the idea that you can only use each letter uh, one time. Okay? And if that's the case, then the first slot allows for nine letters, because there's nine letters in parsimony. Okay? But then the second slot would only allow for eight letters. And then the third slot would only allow for seven, right? Because you would have already used a letter here and a letter here. So if you do that computation, you would have nine times eight times seven, which would equal 504. Okay, multiply there. All right. If in contrast, you're going to allow letters to be used more than once, then you would have nine for the first slot, but then you could have nine again for the second slot, and you could have nine again for the third slot. 
And if you take 9 times 9 times 9, or 9 to the third, it's equal to 729. Okay, what we just looked at are called permutations. And the next step is to develop a more formal uh, mathematical equation for using permutations. But before we do that, recognize that a permutation is where we treat order as important. So AB would be different than BA. Even though they contain the same elements, uh, they're treated differently. Phone numbers are another example, right? Invert your phone number, it's different. To calculate permutations, we use this formula here. So we would take uh, capital N factorial divided by capital N minus little n factorial. The capital N is the number of elements in the larger group. And the little n is the number of elements we're selecting from that group. For example, if we're going to select three letters uh, from the word parsimony, we would have n, capital N, which would be equal to 9 factorial, divided by capital N, which would be 9 minus little n, which is 3 factorial. And continuing on, we could calculate this. Now, you can do this quickly on a calculator or Excel, but I'm going to show you the math so we're clear what we're doing. 9 factorial means 9 times 8 times 7 times 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. doesn't go 0 because 0 factorial is 1. And we would divide that by 9 minus 3 factorial, which is 6 factorial. So we would have 6 times 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Okay. Well, clearly these wash out. And we're left with 9 times 8 times 7, which is 504. So there's 504 permutations um, for this particular example. Now, that may look familiar, because if you go back to the prior slide um, that we did here, when we took 9 times 8 times 7, remember filling in the slots, we got 504. Okay? So we actually did the permutations. Uh, using our tree diagram and the fundamental principle of counting to kind of convey that idea. Okay, now what about combinations? Well, combinations are where order is not important. Uh, a, B, and B, A uh, would be treated exactly the same. An example of this would be the lottery, right? Uh, I don't know how the lottery current works. Uh, the odds are too low for me to uh, play, but I do know that in the past, they used to select seven of those balls out of 49. And it didn't matter what order the numbers were in. If you got all seven numbers out of the 49, then you won the lottery. Combinations is what matters for the lottery and your odds of winning, not permutations. And there's going to be a lot less combinations than permutations. That should be clear because in this example, the outcome AB is different than BA. There's two outcomes. But with combinations, A, B would be the same as B, A. That would just be one outcome. Now, if we use the formula, you'll notice it's exactly the same as permutations, except for this uh, add-on in the denominator, and little n factorial. So we're just going to take our 504, which is what we got, and we're going to divide that by uh, little n factorial. Well, little n is still 3 factorial, and that works out to 504 divided by 3 times 2 times 1, which is, of course, equal to 504 divided by 6, which equals 84. So 84 is the number of combinations uh, you will find. All right, now you could use Excel as well, and I just want to show you this real quick because it's, of course, a lot easier. Um, let's go in and put in the function. Uh, permutations. Okay, permute, pull up the uh, window here, and we put in the number. Uh, now this is going to be capital N, and we then put in the number chosen, which is little n, and you'll notice 504. So there's our permutations. Okay. If we want combinations, we would put equals combinations, okay. and that follows the same pattern. 9, and then 3, 
and you get 84. 